Hey everyone! Welcome to the Photography Masterclass series. In video 2 of this tutorial, let's talk about exposure in photography and how it helps you capture the perfect photograph. We will also be discussing the three main elements of exposure, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO in depth. So, what is exposure in photography? Exposure is simply the amount of light that reaches the camera's sensor to create a photo. It's like a window that lets light in so you can see the world around you, but instead of your eyes, it's the camera that's doing the seeing. When you take a picture, you want the photo to show the scene the way you saw it, with all the highlights, shadows, and everything in between looking just right. That's where exposure comes in. It helps you find the perfect balance of light and dark in your photos. Think of it this way, if you take a photo and the highlights are too bright, you'll lose details in those areas. And if the photo is too dark, you'll lose details in the shadows. So, you want to find that sweet spot where the photo is just right, with all the details showing up just as you saw them. To control the exposure, your camera has three main settings, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. Each of these settings affects how much light reaches the sensor, and by adjusting them, you can control the exposure and get that perfect photo. Exposure Triangle as a photographer, understanding the exposure triangle is crucial to getting the right exposure for your photos. The exposure triangle is a term used in photography to describe the interrelated relationship between three main camera settings, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. These three settings control the amount of light that enters the camera and hits the sensor, which in turn determines the exposure of the final image. Each time you alter one of these options, the other two change as well. Let's have an in-depth understanding of each of these three main settings. Aperture Let's begin with the aperture. Aperture refers to the size of the opening in the lens through which light enters the camera. It is measured in f-stops or f-number, with a lower f-stop number indicating a larger aperture and a higher f-stop number indicating a smaller aperture. Aperture and its terminologies can be confusing to beginners. But we'll explain things to you clearly so you can master the aperture. Here are some common terms used when referring to aperture. Aperture is measured in f-stops, which are numbers that indicate the size of the aperture relative to the focal length of the lens. For example, f2.8 is a larger aperture than f11. Common f-stop numbers are f2.8, f4, f5.6, and so on. 2. Wide aperture. An aperture with a low f-stop number, such as f2.8, is referred to as a wide aperture. A wide aperture lets in more light and creates a shallow depth of field. 3. Narrow aperture. An aperture with a high f-stop number, such as f11, is referred to as a narrow aperture. A narrow aperture lets in less light and creates a deeper depth of field. 4. Maximum Aperture, the largest aperture that a lens is capable of opening to. This is an important factor when choosing a lens, as lenses with larger maximum apertures are often more versatile and better suited for low-light situations. 5. Minimum Aperture, the smallest aperture that a lens is capable of opening to. The minimum aperture setting is often used in bright light to reduce the amount of light entering the camera and prevent overexposure. Aperture controls the amount of light that enters the camera, and it also affects the depth of field in an image. It's important to note that aperture and depth of field are closely related, but not the same thing. Depth of field refers to the portion of a photograph that is in focus and appears sharp, while the rest of the image is blurred. The depth of field is determined by several factors, including aperture, focal length, and distance between the camera and the subject. A shallow depth of field means that only a small portion of the image is in focus, while the rest is blurred. This is often used to create a separation between the subject and the background, drawing the viewer's attention to the main subject. A wide depth of field, on the other hand, means that much of the image is in focus, from the foreground to the background. This is often used in landscape photography or other types of photography where you want to keep as much of the scene in focus as possible. You can control the depth of field by adjusting the aperture setting on your camera. A wide aperture, e.g. f2.8 or f4, will result in a shallow depth of field, 
while a narrow aperture, e.g. f11 or f16, will result in a wider depth of field. Additionally, the focal length of your lens and the distance between the camera and the subject also play a role in determining depth of field. The longer the focal length, the shallower the depth of field will be, and the closer you are to your subject, the shallower the depth of field will be as well. In other words, as the focal length of the lens increases, the depth of field decreases, and as the distance to the subject decreases, the depth of field also decreases. Therefore, when shooting with a long focal length lens or getting close to your subject, you may need to use a smaller aperture to get a deeper depth of field. Understanding and controlling depth of field is an important aspect of photography as it can greatly affect the look and feel of your photos and can help you create images that are more engaging and visually appealing. For example, an aperture of f1.8 will have a shallow depth of field, while an aperture of f16 will have a deeper depth of field. This effect can be used creatively in photography to draw attention to the subject and make it stand out from the background. Bokeh Aperture has a direct impact on the bokeh of an image. Bokeh is a word with Japanese origins, defined as the way the lens renders out-of-focus points of light asterisk. Bokeh refers to the aesthetic quality of the blur in the out-of-focus areas of an image. The bokeh effect is created when a lens is set to a wide aperture, such as f2.8 or f4, which allows for a shallow depth of field. This shallow depth of field means that the background of the image is blurred, creating an aesthetically pleasing, blurred effect. Larger aperture, smaller f-stop number, results in more circular and pleasing bokeh, while smaller aperture, larger f-stop number, results in more geometric and less pleasing bokeh. This can be used to create a more pleasing or interesting background for your subject. The bokeh effect is created by the way that the lens shapes the light that enters the camera. Some lenses are designed to create a more circular and smooth bokeh, while others may create a more jagged or hexagonal bokeh. The quality of the bokeh is determined by the number of aperture blades in the lens and the shape of those blades. Photographers often use bokeh to draw attention to their subject by creating a blurred background that separates the subject from the surroundings. Bokeh can also be used to create a dreamy or romantic feel in a photo. Composition Always remember that aperture can affect the overall composition of an image. When using a larger aperture, smaller f-stop number, the shallow depth of field can be used to isolate the subject and draw attention to it, making it stand out from the background. This can be very effective in portraits, where the subject's face is in sharp focus while the background is blurred. On the other hand, when using a smaller aperture, larger f-stop number, the deeper depth of field can be used to keep the entire scene in focus, which can be useful in landscapes and architectural photography. Aperture is a characteristic of a lens, which means that it can vary from lens to lens. Some lenses, such as those used in compact cameras and smartphones, have a fixed aperture, while others, such as those used in DSLRs and mirrorless cameras, allow for adjustable aperture. Sharpness Another aspect to consider is that aperture can also affect the overall sharpness of an image. Lenses are typically sharpest at one or two stops down from the widest aperture, so if you're looking for the sharpest image possible, it's often best to avoid using the widest aperture on your lens. Aperture also affects the amount of light that enters the camera over a period of time, so it's important to consider this when working with moving subjects. A fast enough shutter speed is needed to freeze the motion while still allowing enough light to enter the camera to properly expose the image. In low light conditions, a larger aperture, smaller f-stop number, can help to reduce the need for a higher ISO or slower shutter speed. You will have a clear understanding about this when we discuss about shutter speed later in this video. Lens Vignetting When using a wide aperture, low f-stop number, it's important to be aware of lens vignetting. Lens vignetting is when the edges of a photo look a bit darker or less bright compared to the center. This can happen for a few reasons, like the type of lens you're using, how wide the aperture is open, if you're using a lens hood, or if you have any filters on the lens. While vignetting can add a cool look to some photos, sometimes it might make the photo look a little bit off.
Don't worry though, some cameras have a built-in way to fix vignetting, and you can also use photo editing software to make it look better. Lens flare and ghosting. Lens flare and ghosting in photography refer to similar but distinct phenomena caused by bright light entering the lens. Lens flare occurs when bright light directly enters the lens and reflects off of the various glass elements inside, creating colorful streaks or circles in the photo. While lens flare can be an intentional effect to add mood or atmosphere to a photo, it can also be unwanted and detract from the overall image quality. Ghosting, on the other hand, refers to a type of lens flare that results in faint, ghost-like duplicates of bright light sources appearing in the photo. This occurs when light enters the lens at an oblique angle and reflects off of the surfaces of the lens elements, creating multiple reflections that show up in the image. To reduce lens flare and ghosting in a photo, photographers can use lens hoods or adjust the position of the camera to minimize the amount of direct light entering the lens. Additionally, some cameras and lenses have coatings designed to minimize these effects, and post-processing software can be used to further reduce their impact. Aperture can also affect the amount of lens distortion. Wide-angle lenses often have a tendency to produce barrel distortion, while telephoto lenses can produce pincushion distortion. The aperture can impact the amount of lens distortion by affecting the amount of light that enters the lens. Building on what we just discussed, different apertures are used for different types of photography. Landscape photography, landscapes typically require a large depth of field, which can be achieved by using a small aperture such as f11 or f16. This will ensure that both the foreground and background of the scene are in focus. Architecture photography, in architectural photography, you often want to capture a lot of detail and sharpness, especially in large structures. For this reason, a smaller aperture, such as f8 to f16, is often preferred to increase depth of field and keep more of the building in focus. Portrait photography. In portrait photography, a shallow depth of field is often used to isolate the subject and create a pleasing bokeh effect. Aperture settings such as f1.8 or f2.8 are often used for this type of photography. Fashion photography. Fashion photography often involves creating a mood or atmosphere, and shallow depth of field can be used to draw attention to the clothing or accessories and create a dreamy, blurred background. For this reason, a wider aperture, such as f1.4 to f2.8, is often preferred. Food photography. Food photography is all about making the food look delicious and appetizing. A wider aperture, such as f2 to f5.6, can be used to create a shallow depth of field and create a nice bokeh effect in the background, drawing attention to the food itself. Product photography. Product photography is all about showcasing the product in a clean and clear way so that potential buyers can see all the details and features. For this reason, a smaller aperture, such as f11 to f16, is often preferred to increase depth of field and keep the product in focus from front to back. Low light photography. When shooting in low light conditions, it may be necessary to use a wider aperture such as f2.8 or f4 in order to let more light into the camera and achieve a fast enough shutter speed to prevent camera shake. Macro photography. Macro photography typically requires a small aperture to achieve a large depth of field and keep the entire subject in focus. Aperture settings such as f8 or f11 are often used for macro photography. Sports and action photography. Sports and action photography often requires a fast shutter speed to freeze motion, and a wider aperture such as f2.8 or f4 is often used to let in more light and achieve a fast enough shutter speed. Keep in mind that these are general guidelines and that every photographer and situation is different, so feel free to experiment and see what works best for you. In conclusion, Aperture is a powerful tool in photography that allows you to control the amount of light entering the camera, the depth of field, bokeh, overall sharpness, and composition of an image. Remember, every situation is unique and presents its own set of challenges and opportunities for creativity. Keep an open mind and continue to experiment with different aperture settings to capture the shots you envision. Now, let's shift our focus to shutter speed. Shutter speed refers to the amount of time that the camera sensor is exposed to light. 
It is measured in fractions of a second, such as 1 60th, 1 125th, or 1 1000th of a second. Shutter speed can be used to control the amount of light entering the camera, allowing you to properly expose an image. Faster shutter speeds allow less light into the camera and are useful in bright light or when you want to freeze a fast-moving subject. Slower shutter speeds allow more light into the camera and are useful in low light or when you want to create a sense of motion in a photograph. Shutter speed can also be used creatively to convey a sense of motion or movement in an image. This can be achieved by using a slower shutter speed and panning the camera to follow a moving subject. This will create a sense of motion in the image while keeping the subject in focus and sharp. Conversely, using a faster shutter speed and panning the camera in the opposite direction of a moving subject can create a sense of motion and motion blur in the background while keeping the subject in focus and sharp. Camera Shake Camera shake refers to the blur that occurs in a photo when the camera moves during exposure. This can happen when a photographer holds the camera by hand and the movement of their hand causes the camera to move during the exposure, resulting in a blurry image. Long exposures, such as those taken at night or in low light conditions, can result in camera shake and motion blur if the camera is not held steady. To prevent camera shake, photographers can use a tripod or a stable surface to keep the camera still during exposure. They can also increase the shutter speed to freeze any movement or increase the ISO to make the camera more sensitive to light, allowing for a faster shutter speed. Additionally, some cameras have built-in image stabilization systems that can help reduce camera shake. Additionally, the reciprocal rule is a guideline for photographers to determine the minimum shutter speed required to avoid camera shake in handheld photography. The reciprocal rule states that the minimum shutter speed for handheld photography should be equal to the reciprocal of the focal length of the lens being used. So, if you're using a 50mm lens, the minimum shutter speed should be 1 50th of a second or faster to avoid camera shake to a certain extent. The general rule of reciprocity is that if you double the shutter speed, you should also have the aperture or double the ISO to maintain the same exposure. This is because the aperture controls the amount of light that enters the camera through the lens, while the shutter speed controls how long that light is allowed to enter the camera. For example, if you take a photo at f8, 1 100th of a second, you can achieve the same exposure by adjusting the aperture to f5.6 and the shutter speed to 1 200th of a second. Understanding the concept of reciprocity can be very useful in photography as it allows you to make quick adjustments to the aperture, shutter speed, and ISO to achieve the correct exposure and get the desired effect in your photos. Some cameras have a feature called bulb mode which allows the shutter to stay open as long as the shutter button is depressed. This allows for very long exposures such as for night photography or light painting. To achieve the desired effect, it is important to understand the relationship between shutter speed, aperture, and ISO and how they work together to create a well-exposed image. And also, it's important to practice and experiment with different shutter speeds to understand how they affect the final image. Another important aspect of shutter speed to consider is flash synchronization. Most cameras have a maximum shutter speed that they can synchronize with a flash, typically between 1 200th and 1 250th of a second, depending on the camera. If you try to use a faster shutter speed, the flash will not be able to properly illuminate the scene and you will get an underexposed image that is partially or fully blacked out. To overcome this limitation, you can use a technique called high-speed sync which allows you to use faster shutter speeds with a flash. This is achieved by firing the flash multiple times during the exposure, allowing you to use faster shutter speeds and still achieve the correct exposure. We will be discussing more on flash settings in the upcoming videos. Another use of shutter speed is called dragging the shutter, which is a photography technique used to create a sense of motion and blur in images. This is done by using a slower shutter speed than what is typically used for the lighting conditions. When the camera's shutter is open for a longer period of time, any movement in the frame will be captured as a blur, while the static elements of the scene will remain sharp. This effect is often used to convey a sense of movement or action, or to create a sense of time passing. 
It's a creative tool that can add a unique look to your images and is particularly useful for capturing motion, such as the flow of water or the movement of people or vehicles. Shutter speed also affects the way light is captured and can be used to control the amount of light that enters the camera. When working in low light conditions, a slow shutter speed will allow more light to enter the camera and properly expose the image. But it also increases the risk of camera shake and motion blur, so a tripod or other stabilizing device may be necessary. Shutter Priority Mode, TV or S on the camera, allows you to set the shutter speed and the camera will automatically adjust the aperture to achieve the correct exposure. It's particularly useful when you want to control motion blur, such as in sports or action photography. It's important to keep in mind that when using a fast shutter speed, you may need to use a wider aperture or a higher ISO to achieve the correct exposure. This is because using a fast shutter speed will allow less light into the camera. The silky water effect is a photography technique where the photographer captures the movement of water in a slow and smooth manner, creating an image that appears like silk. This is achieved by using a slow shutter speed, usually between 1 15th to several seconds, while taking a photo of moving water, such as a waterfall, river, or ocean. The slow shutter speed captures the motion of the water, producing a blur that gives the appearance of silky, flowing water. To achieve the silky water effect, it's important to use a tripod to keep the camera steady, as well as a neutral density filter to reduce the amount of light entering the lens and allow for a slower shutter speed. The aperture and ISO settings can also be adjusted to achieve the desired effect. In landscape photography, slow shutter speeds can be used to capture the movement of clouds, creating a sense of drama and movement in the image. In wildlife photography, fast shutter speeds are often used to freeze the action of fast-moving subjects, such as birds in flight or animals running. It's important to practice and experiment with different shutter speeds to understand how they affect the final image and to learn how to capture the perfect shot. Now let's move on to the third element of exposure, which is ISO. ISO International Organization for Standardization is an international organization that develops and publishes standards for various industries and technologies, including photography. In the context of photography, ISO refers to the sensitivity of the camera's image sensor to light. A higher ISO value means that the camera's sensor is more sensitive to light, while a lower ISO value means that the sensor is less sensitive to light. ISO is a fundamental concept in photography and it plays a critical role in determining the final outcome of an image. A camera's ISO value can be adjusted, typically in the range of 100 to 6400 or higher, depending on the camera model. A lower ISO value, such as 100 or 200, is typically used in bright lighting conditions to avoid overexposure. A higher ISO value, such as 800, 1600 or higher, is used in low light conditions to capture an image without using a flash or a tripod. Higher ISO values result in a more sensitive image sensor, allowing for faster shutter speeds and or wider aperture settings in low light conditions. However, a higher ISO value also results in more noise or grain in the image. It's a trade-off between getting a properly exposed image and preserving image quality. As we discussed all along in this video, ISO should be used in conjunction with shutter speed and aperture to achieve a proper exposure. Understanding and adjusting these three elements of exposure is a crucial part of photography and allows photographers to have more control over the final result. It's also important to note that different cameras have different capabilities when it comes to ISO performance. Some cameras have better image sensors that can produce high-quality images at higher ISO values, while others may produce more noise at high ISO values. When selecting an ISO value, the general rule of thumb is to use the lowest ISO value possible for a given lighting situation. This helps to minimize noise or grain in the image and maintain maximum image quality. However, in low light conditions, a higher ISO value may be necessary to get a properly exposed image. In addition to adjusting ISO to get the desired exposure, it can also be used creatively to achieve a specific effect. For example, a high ISO value can be used to capture fast-moving subjects in low light without using a flash or a tripod.
On the other hand, a low ISO value can be used to create a motion blur effect with a slow shutter speed. It's also worth mentioning that modern digital cameras have an auto ISO setting, which allows the camera to automatically adjust the ISO value based on the lighting conditions. This can be convenient for photographers who are just starting out or for those who don't want to deal with the technicalities of exposure. However, it's important to understand that using auto ISO can sometimes result in images that are not optimally exposed or have more noise than desired. By learning how to adjust ISO manually, photographers can have more control over the final outcome of their images and achieve their creative vision. In conclusion, ISO is a versatile and powerful tool in photography. By understanding how it works and how to adjust it, you can create truly unique and stunning images. So, there you have it. Exposure in photography is all about finding the right balance of light and dark so you can capture the magic of a moment and make it last forever. Remember, practice makes perfect, and the more you shoot, the more comfortable you will become with adjusting your exposure. And that's it for today's episode on exposure. We hope you found it informative and helpful. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button for more photography tutorials. And if you have any questions or suggestions for future videos, leave us a comment below. Until next time, keep shooting and have fun.